Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, your host for Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for end-of-life care and assist people talking about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives and to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for the beginning of this conversation is not in the intensive care unit, but together. Now, together we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make these difficult conversations easier. Together, we can make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. And if you're ready to join, we ask you to join with us, navigating the journey. We are here to explore those choices. This is a conversation that every one of us needs to have, and yet few are prepared for it. Too many people in our society have no idea how to properly help a loved one who is at the end of life. We don't know what to say, how to act, what their needs are of our loved ones. Today's guest is my dear, dear friend, the Reverend Dr. George Scott of Punahou School and Central Union Church, and aloha and shalom. Aloha and shalom to you, my friend. Good and to be with you today. It is wonderful. <laughs> today, we are a few days before the holy season. And I said, Shalom, because this is, now you have to tell me if I'm right here. This is the first time in many, many years. 59 years. 59 years that Hanukkah and Christmas have come at the same time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So yeah. we want to, again, say aloha, uh, meli kaliki maka, exactly. shalom to everyone that's out there. This is, this is a great season, it's a, great a great time. It's a great season, yeah. So tell me about you. We've been friends for, I was trying to remember how long. It's been over 20 something years. Yeah, it has for been. Sure. Yeah, it has absolutely. been. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, so tell me about you. Well, I'm a native of Detroit, Michigan, and I've uh, been here in Hawaii oh, approaching 30 years. And uh, actually, I came here for a one year uh, residency as a chaplain at Queens Medical Center, and it turned out to be quite an experience and I'm still here today yeah so I that's part of my journey part of my journey yeah. so as a chaplain at the hospital then you really came to see end-of-life issues quite a bit quite a few I would say yes and some were um, enlivening and uh, awakening and and really did help me in this new culture to understand better how perhaps people here in Hawaii celebrate end of life or or welcome end of life or of course like many of us um, sometimes uh, don't want to look at end of life but yes absolutely and, and that's true of all cultures but it was truly a way of me um, being um, immersed into Hawaii absolutely now is that different let's say from where you came from from Chicago uh, Detroit no um, oh well, Detroit yeah no I mean the I, welcoming and the and way they right right well yeah there, there are some there's some big differences. There's big differences, but then even in the differences, there's similarities. For instance, uh, being a chaplain here in Hawaii, in my first year, I was surprised to see that when a, a loved one was ill and perhaps near the end of life, that the hospital allowed multiple guests to come in. I mean, at that time, we would have maybe 15 or 20 people in one room yes. with ukuleles and singing and they asked me to join in and I said sure because they were singing old hymns that uh, I was familiar with and I re recall calling my mother on the phone back in Detroit and you know she's from the south and said mom guess what they're they're singing some of the songs we sing in church and and so gathered around their loved one just singing and and trying to make the, the moment welcoming children as well as adults in the, in the same room so that was very interesting and, and a beautiful thing at the same time yeah. and so that's totally different than now. Um, I remember as a child mm -hmm. that nobody was in the hospital at the end of life. They were all at home. At home. Mm -hmm. So now that our medical technology has extended life, mm -hmm. 
so that people are now on these machines and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. How does that work? How do you, from well, going from this comfort of being at, at home, home with family right, to being right. in with these machines, yeah. it, what did you see? Well, over the years, as even from the first day of chaplaincy to now, things have, have evolved. Uh, hospice, I think, has done a great, great deal of, of good in the community to help us understand that at the end of life, it's your journey. It's that person's journey. It's not necessarily the hospital's journey. It's that person's journey. Some people choose to say, you know, if this is what's happening and my family agrees with it, I like to just go home. And some actually choose to go home, be disconnected, be on palliative care, comfort care, and then when the time comes, they're surrounded by loved ones. And so that is a, a piece that I think has truly been enlightening for our community, that that is possible. However, it seems that more often the case, especially when unexpected uh, death occurs, that you may be, you may find yourself in a hospital, well, your loved ones in a hospital. Yeah, they well, are connected to the device. Right, when, you know. when an accident or something. Right, but, exactly. but given, <laughs> let's say, a terminal illness, yes, yes. where you know that no matter what the medical people are going to do, that this is, mm -hmm. yes, this yes. is, is this going to be the end? Right, yeah, right, right. That right, they, right. they can't fix it. Exactly. And part of that is um, for the good of the family. I've heard many people tell me, I really don't want my daughter or my son or my husband or wife to have to take care of me at home when I'm in a position that I can't care for myself. The doctors and nurses are professionals. I'll take my comfort care in a medical setting. That way my family can come say hi to me, go home, visit when they want to, and they don't have to be you know, involved with the day-to-day pretty sometimes not glorious part of caring for someone at that point. And, and so that's sometimes the desire of the person that's in the bed. Yes. Yeah. Say that. Yeah. Well, now, I had my mother with me the, the last year of her life. And for one day, everything was fine. The next day, I was a caregiver. Mm. No experience, no, no just boom. Yeah. You know, things happen. Mm -hmm. However, what I did learn in that year of caring for her is, well, I learned a lot. <laughs> you know, a lot of this was brand new. Mm -hmm. What do I do next? Uh, however, that year of sharing that love mm. that I had never had with her, never, because she was always the mother. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No matter how old I was, when she yeah. would say, Honey bun? I said, yes, mama. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so like, I, I would yeah. go back to being five years old. Right. So caring for her, I got to be the adult mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to love her like I had never done before. Mm -hmm. So I am eternally grateful for that, that year. Exactly. However, I wish that she had not had to suffer like that. Exactly. I, I wished that there was something I could do to, to ameliorate her. the suffering. Right, and, and that's where I believe some of the modern technology has truly helped in that way. Mm -hmm. That comfort care is truly, um, have made so many advances so that uh, a, a person is not necessarily in pain while they're going through this transition. Right. The, the greatest transition that in, in, in life, so to speak. So that you don't see them experiencing pain. And that's what I think most people enter the room say, is, is he in pain? Is, mm -hmm. he, is he hurting right now? And when the medical uh, professionals say, oh, no, 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 he's probably not in any pain, there's a sense of just peace that comes over people. And they go, oh, okay, long as he's not in pain, as long as she's not hurting, you know. Yeah. So in your, your congregational, mm. is that what yeah. Central Union is? Yeah, Punahou, Central Union, uh, even the... Uh, Arcadia, because I, I do a lot with Arcadia retirement residents too. But, but go ahead, I'm sorry. So, now tell me what the difference is in the congregational church and some of the other uh, denominations. With regards to death and dying, or what? Well, just basically the difference. Basically, where did well, it come from? How did? Oh, what's well, a, the congregational church, you know, here, especially here in Hawaii. Uh, has its roots, well, the United Church of Christ, which is what I'm a part of, has its roots in the Congregational Church. And as you probably know, that the, the Congregational Christians were credited 
with being responsible for bringing um, Christianity to Hawaii. Oh. And um, many of the uh, beliefs, say, of Baptist, Congregational, Methodist, Episcopal, they're pretty close to each other. Uh, we just have uh, different sacraments and things like that, but um, very close in, in the, in the uh, belief of, of Christ, uh, God, and uh, the Holy Spirit being very, very much a part of all of our um, belief systems, too. Then how you live that out in the world may be a little bit different, but the hope is that the faith itself shows through in, 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 in your walk of life, how you live with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, so, and are there any differences at the end of life? Yes, and, and most congregations and uh, denominations are becoming really fluid with regards to family wishes. There may be individual uh, desires uh, or, or, I hate to use the term rules, but, but there may be ways that um, religions observe the end of life that are um, specific to that faith. You know. However, again, here in Hawaii, it's quite different because cremation is a, is a huge part of, of the community. However, there's some communities that say don't agree with cremating. Again, it is the individual's desire. That person may say, I don't want a casket. I want to be cremated. I don't want my family to look at, you know, and that sometimes may go against some of the beliefs of the, um, that particular denomination. But here in Hawaii, cremation and a memorial is much more common than a, uh, a casket and a body and a funeral. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's interesting, those well, two um, distinctions there. I think more than, than religion, mm -hmm. when you live on an island and land is scarce, buying property to right that that's yeah. that's a rather absolutely yeah you got to think about it's expensive and it is yeah i have um i was i have had the honor of of doing a memorial service and when they open the niche there's three uh, urns there already mm -hmm. so grandma's urn is there granddaddy's urn yeah. is there and and moms and now they're placing dad's urn so that's in a small space, like you said, yes. in terms of property, you know, then the prices are still probably pretty high. But, but the ability to say, I'm going to place this urn with my other family, mm -hmm. and, it, and they're all together physically in that space in terms of their ashes being there, is really interesting. You, could, you really can't do that with a, with a, a casket. A casket, right, yeah. Right. I have, I don't know how many a little ashes of different people, my mother, of course, mm -hmm. and uncle and friends and whatnot in my office. And my husband says, no wonder I can't come in. There's just so many spirits already here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they're pleasant spirits. They are, are they to, are. To yeah, welcome uh, you yes. and, and, and make your day feel better. But yeah. Yeah, and I know, in, say, in my community back home in Detroit, the African-American community, it's, um, I don't know if I've ever been to a service where there was not the, the, the body. body there because yeah. it's just not a cremating um, community. No, you don't. You just don't, don't do that. Don't do that. You yeah. know? And so it's different. When I go home and I'm in uh, my mother's service uh, a couple years ago, it was challenging for me to look at her that way because I know her a certain way. Yeah. And so I was you know, preaching the uh, eulogy and all of that. And, and I just said, well, I know my mother and that's not her right there. Right. You know, she's, she's different from what I'm looking at that, there. Yes. You know, so. And, uh, and uh, but now we are going to go to a break. But when we come back, uh, speaking of black churches or African-American churches, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the process of home going. Mm. So most people, that's a foreign word, mm -hmm. home going. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, we go to a break, and then when we come back, let's talk about that, because that's such a marvelous uh, occasion. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Okay, it is just, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu and I co-host Hawaii Farmers Series with Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. We talk about Hawaii's local farmers and their supporters. In order to have a vibrant and sustainable local food system, uh, farmers are always the foundation, but there's so many other people involved in the community that help support those farmers. So we bring those folks onto our show every Thursday at 4 p.m. 
we get their backstory, their history, find out a little more about them, and we find out why they love what they do and their perspective and their advice on how we can continue to have a dynamic and vibrant and sustainable local food system. So we, again, we broadcast live every Thursday at 4 p.m. And you can also catch us on ThinkTech's YouTube channel as well as Alelo54. So we hope you tune in and join us. Thank you. Hi, we're back. And we mentioned home going. And that is something that is I don't know if the word is indigenous, but is peculiar to mm. or to the African American culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, tell me about you. You've been to home goings. Oh, I've been a part of quite been, a few. Yes, quite a few that, that touched my life. And I would I mentioned um, my mother's passing, but then my sister, who was um, we sang together in gospel choirs, and she took it to the next level and traveled with a a very well-known gospel choir and they went all over the country and so when she passed away uh, her service was like this giant gospel concert I mean they literally I get goosebumps thinking about they sang these powerful songs they stood in front of the, the, the family so if you can imagine 40 or 50 powerful gospel singers in a choir singing at the height of their voices and and you would think that the whole church would just shout and they did people shouted and screamed it's like it's, it's a home going it's, it's like a awakening it's like this interesting thing where it's painful because your loved one's there and you're losing them but it's powerful and beautiful because you feel the joy that uh, this is not the end see that's the that's the end it's like this is not the end this is just a part of the journey and the part of the uh, uh, few steps in her story and her story is yet to be told because now she's going home to be with the Lord so the home going is well this is just one part of life you're going on to the next part of life and so they sing her on you know to another place and the family is well well loved and cared for and it takes all day to oh do it, it does it's a long, all day it's a, long, thing. It's a, a lot, long day a lot of eating and singing and, singing and, and, yes. and praying and praising and all kinds of stuff like yeah that. yeah I noticed in um, Mrs. King's mm. home going mm -hmm. uh, that the mainstream media had no idea what was going on. What was going on. Right, they right. didn't know how to report it mm -hmm. and it was absolutely gorgeous and it just went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But you talked about joyful and pain. And pain, yeah. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us, you, you're, you've got a degree in... Yeah, a, in, a doctorate in ministry in the area of uh, counseling and grief. Okay. And, um, so yeah. let's let's talk about that joy and pain and grief and yeah. and dealing with that. Yeah, that's a. I think I I ended up in that area because I had that experience of my sister, right? You know, and how that um, impacted me for her to be cared for, but also the pain that I experienced. And and you know, we know that there are stages of grief, and and they're not simply easily laid out like you say well there's denial there's bargaining there's anger there's acceptance and and you know th those they don't always flow in order so what happens quite often is that uh, you at this point of life where now you realize that this person is gone but you don't want it to be real so that denial sets in that's usually usually that one is right up front that it's like well wait a minute wait a minute they're not really gone they're not really gone, so you kind of shut down, you become numb, find yourself waking up in the morning thinking that that was just a dream, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, the ways you, you might experience it. And, and then the other is the, this bargaining, the bargaining of saying, if I could just do this, then maybe I could heal from this and, and it won't happen. And, and many of these stages of grief were really laid out as um, anticipatory. In other words, I know I have this illness, I know that it's, they're saying that I won't live. However, I'm gonna deny that. Uh -huh. I'm also gonna bargain with God. I'm also gonna get angry with God. I'm also going to sometimes sort of accept it, but then I'm gonna go into this deep place of darkness and depression. You know, so it's that mixed up kind of crazy thing that, that we call grief. You know? Do we grieve prior to? Yeah, that's, that's um, actually, it's, it's actually very important 
be, and the reason for that is like, um, so if we were in, quite often when you go in for a surgery, they say, well, I want you to get real healthy first before the surgery. Right. So that when you go through it, you'll come out on the other side and you'll be a little better. Um, it's the same thing with grieving. We often um, grieve heavily prior to the death. And, and uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who gave us those five stages of grief, she really was studying anticipatory grief. That, and she worked with people who had a, um, a terminal illness diagnosis and understood that here are the things you're going to go through and here's what I'm experiencing with you prior to going and and I have been in my journey with others experienced the same thing and it's it's really very powerful so to let's with. talk about the terminally ill mm -hmm. and and what they go through like you said uh, there's the grief prior to, mm -hmm. they know they're going mm -hmm. they know that this tumor is not going to get any better there's nothing medical mm -hmm. people can do mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, we ask at that point if they have a choice. How would they? What they want? Mm -hmm. Is that adding to the difficulty, or does that relieve? It's different for everyone. It really is. I mean, every person experiences it differently. Um, I had a very, very close friend of mine who res was in the exploring process. You know, with you on Sunday one day on Wednesday was in the hospital and never left and did not know that um, he was ill. And in that process, the, it, it started to happen, the bargaining with God that, boy, when I get better, I'm going to do this with the church or in the community or, boy, when, um, you know, I've done a lot with God. I don't understand why this is even happening to me. Why would this be, you know, so I think that it's each individual and then towards the end, you know, sometimes healing takes place in ways that we don't understand, like healing with family members. Family members come from far away that maybe you hadn't talked to in a while. And in this you know, person's case, it was. A, a family member came, they had a great conversation, kind of a reunion, and they'd been estranged from each other 10 or 15 years. So there's this healing sometimes that takes place that we can't understand. It's not physical, because this person did you know, pass away. However, there was a healing that took place that maybe even greater than, than the others because to have a, someone you love separated from you and then come back to you and you can be together is, is powerful. So it's, di it's different for every individual. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is a bit, uh, well, it's the same thing. We had a couple of uh, priests talk to us about it. Mm. They had this suggestion that we should all, while we're healthy, mm -hmm. have a meeting with family mm -hmm. and the doctor mm -hmm. to talk about end-of-life choices mm -hmm. when we're healthy, mm -hmm. not when at the, right. that critical moment. Right. So we should make these choices now exactly. with a family. They suggested we have a family get-together, invite mm -hmm. all family from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Let's okay. get together. Mm -hmm. And so, and make these choices, okay. sign these directives, mm -hmm. and then make sure everybody has a copy. Mm. That's very proactive, yeah. very proactive. Let's do it now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before we get to that emotional upset mm -hmm. when we may or may not make the right choices. You know, it, it, takes a, it takes a special person and family to do that, to be honest for what I've seen in my life and in my journeys. and. I'll say, like, my wife is, is a very special person, and she has a little box, and she says, this is where this is kept, this is what I want in my service, this is what, and I'm like, okay, honey, I get it, and here I am, dealing with this all the time, but I don't want to hear it telling <laughs> me, this is what I want, <laughs> don't do this, don't, don't, don't bring any heroic efforts to try to bring me back, and, you know, I don't want to hear it, but at the same time, I get it, and I, and I observe it, and she, t she has told all of us. This is the deal. So I think it takes a special family and individual to do it, but it is a wonderful thing if we could do that more often. Yeah. yeah. And it's happening more often. Now. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. And I just thought that's such a good idea. I don't know how to move from here to there to see that people can get there, can get there to do that. However, part of what we're here for mm -hmm. is to talk about it, right. to have this conversation that people can be comfortable with talking about it, even if they don't have the boxes like you do. <laughs> now, my husband, of course, would not talk about it, mm. even though 
he signed the directive, but he's not going to talk about it. Right, <laughs> no, right, he's not yeah, going to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and my daughter is a hospice nurse, so oh. we already got this one planned. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's this good. is yeah, this yeah. is it. Yeah. Uh, that the idea of being able to come together to have mm -hmm. this conversation, just like you and I are having a mm -hmm. conversation, mm -hmm. and and to be able to see the beauty in yeah. in this transformation, this yeah. this home going, as we call exactly. it. To see the beauty in it, mm -hmm. rather than the, some kind of terror. Yeah, yeah, and, and, it, and it has it has stigmas for many of our many of our faiths and many of our cultures. There's a huge stigma around death, and and in you know, say an African American culture, there's a lot of, of stigmas around it that are in the younger generations. They're kind of letting that go. However, right. you know where when I grew up and. You know, and in the 50s, 60s, it was very heavily that you didn't, don't do this, you don't talk about that, because if you talk about it, it's going to happen. happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen, yeah. If you talk about it, it's going to happen. happen. Like, well, we all are going to transition exactly. out of here yeah. some way. We will die someday, you know, so. But, you know, you know. in the early days, uh, especially in New Orleans, you see the mm. parade mm. and what yeah. have you, because life was so difficult that this was a celebration, a celebration. Of, of leaving a this, true going home. a true going home. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah oh, this, absolutely. Is, this is, life as, as we knew it mm -hmm. in those years was really not right. a pleasant thing. Yeah, you so cry this, coming in, <laughs> yeah, and you, you sing going, going out. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, I love that. Uh, this, to experience that is just one unbelievable thing. You know? It is. Mm -hmm. I went to one uh, home going and they actually did the hula in mm -hmm. front of the. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, I've, I've, absolutely I've did the hula. the hula, mm -hmm. and uh, even though the person was African American, it was so totally local. Right. Right. Well, that's the beauty of living here. It is. And experiencing the the culture and the and the um, the acceptance of, of of all cultures and races and and uh, belief systems. It's really great to blend a lot of those things together. And know? and I guess that's where we come to saying about the choice mm. people mm -hmm. have to have because of all the different cultures and all the different traditions and beliefs mm -hmm. we have to have the ability to choose what works for us not what works for them Some or more. them exactly. or this religion or this society that we we have to be able to do that mm -hmm. simply mm -hmm. because we have blended families and exactly and yeah. yeah yeah we we've got and to I do think that. Living here, we should truly be proactive, and I'm going to have to get a little more proactive, <laughs> like, like my wife is, but, but because you're far away from perhaps relatives right. who really may want to have something to say about things, or, or, and should. Yeah. So maybe that meeting you're talking about, Marsha, is one that we should do. We should do. Mm -hmm. We can do it on, on Facebook, Skype, yeah, on any way. Yes, yeah, we yeah. should. Well, you know, of course, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you, and it went much too fast. Yeah, we'll have to do this than again. I yeah. mm -hmm. Again, real quick, mm -hmm. real quick. Mm -hmm. Christmas and Hanukkah mm -hmm. together. together. How long? Many years? Fifty-nine years. Fifty-nine years. Since we've uh, had so those we, two celebrated together. Yeah. So, we, are there special celebrations that combine well, the two? You know what? I, I, I was here with uh, a rabbi and and. Um, my good, our good friend Seymour the other day, Rabbi Aronowitz and Seymour, and yes, I think there'll be some special celebrations and getting together. Good. And the world coming together. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Mm -hmm. And goodbye. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha.